answering your tough financial questions for the past 26 years. It's Allworth's Money Matters with co-hosts Scott Hansen and Pat McLean. Would you like an opinion on a financial matter you're dealing with? Whether it's about retirement, investments, taxes, or 401ks, Scott Hansen and Pat McLean would like to help you by answering your call. To join Allworth's Money Matters, call now at 833-99-WORTH. That's 833-99-WORTH. Welcome to Allworth's Money Matters. I'm Scott Hansen. I'm Pat McLean. Thanks for joining That's us. That's right. Glad you are here this weekend, or if you listen to via podcast, whenever you might be listening to the program. But uh, both myself and my co-host here, we are both practicing financial advisors. That means we spend our time during our week helping people like yourself plan their financial future. We come here on the weekends. We broadcast on the weekends to be your financial advisors on the air. And, and to be frank, we've been we've both been practicing advisors. I think, Pat, you've hit three decades now. I think so, probably 30 years. Yeah, because uh, I started about a year after you did, mm-hmm. and I started in June of, of 1990. You have a great memory for that. I have no recollection. I, remember, I can remember numbers, names of streets, towns, people. Forget about it. Yeah. I could have dinner with somebody. Two days later, I don't remember their name. Yeah. It's oh, a, well, I'm not that bad. I am bad at it. But I can remember all kinds of weird dates. Yeah. I'm Sorry. like Rain Man. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Whatever happened to Judge Wapner? Come to speak of. He got Judge Judy. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I enjoy a little Judge Judy sometimes. I've never watched more than two minutes of oh, Judge Judy. Maybe I'm like Jiffy Lube waiting for my car and Judge Judy's on. That's the only time I've ever it seen is, Judge Judy. I got to tell you, if you just want to chill. So my point is we're, we are uh, financial advisors. We spent our career helping people like yourself, and a good part of our weekday now is leading the organization as we've grown over the years. Yes. So in full disclosure, uh, we spend less time with individual clients, but we still love doing this radio program. And we we've still been doing have this, our own clients. Yeah, though. we've been doing this for a number of years, uh, to, um, almost 20. 25 years, 24 years, uh, because we enjoy helping people. And if you have a question for us, you'd like uh, another opinion on it, something or... Just want to run something by us. Maybe you're getting close to retirement and trying to see if you've got your ducks in a row or someone's recommending a product or you're looking at your estate plan or trying to figure out other ways to structure your taxes or you want to buy a vacation home and trying to figure out how you're going to do that or you want to leave the state when you're tired. Whatever the financial question is, we'd love to take your call and to join the program. Our contact number is 1-833-99-WORTH. That's toll free, 833 99 Worth numerically, it's 833 999 6784. And I think we've got a good show lined up. Oh, it's (laughs) one of our best. Why don't we do it and see? Well, in part, (laughs) you can decide after the fact. But you know what ends up happening is we, we spend quite a bit of time prepping, and we've got a variety of different topics that we may or may not get to depending on the flow of the show. Yes. And sometimes it's because calls lead us a certain direction or and have certain sometimes questions. And sometimes the, we just get off track. Yeah. But is, sometimes the calls lead to um, longer discussions. Oftentimes. Yeah. So let's start off in California with Kevin. Kevin, you're with All Worth's Money Matters. Hello, Scott and Pat. Uh, how are you guys doing? We're wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for joining the program. Good. Thank you. Um, well, I'm calling you from Torrance, California. and uh, Torrance? McLean, this, two doors down from me, actually. Um, Who it is? I don't know if there's a connection there, but... Um, uh, no, but Scott grew up in Torrance. I went to South Torrance High School. Oh. Okay. Well, you might be related to the McLeans uh, a couple of doors down. <laughs> nah, from nah, me. No, um, no. They, no. No. Okay. No. Anyway, anyway, what can south, we do for by you? By the way, South was much better than West High or North High. Okay, what what can South. we Kevin, what can we do for you? Okay, here's my question. Um, it is how do you evaluate the future health or claims paying ability of a defined benefit plan? I'm approaching retirement in the next few years and um, I have uh, the good fortune to have such a plan and I'm wondering if there are companies or consultants who do this for individuals. Um, I work in the banking industry. My plan has about 300 employers and 35,000 employees. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the largest 10 or so of the employers are quasi-public banks. There's one government employer, and the rest are small banks. Um, Got it. Um, I think the – go ahead. So you have insurance on it. So you've got a form of insurance. It's a uh, from the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which is the PBGC. And I'll actually share something with you. My father, when he was alive, worked at Levitt's Furniture, and they had a defined benefit plan. When Levitt's went into bankruptcy, um, his pension check then started coming directly from the PBGC. Um, but the thing about the insurance that the PBGC pays, it actually is based upon a formula yeah, that maximums. has to do with your age and a maximum. Yeah, so the maximum, uh, by the way, is roughly $67,000 a year for someone who retires at age 65 or older. So the younger someone retires before that, there's a discount on it. So as an example, a lot of people were were impacted this is were airline pilots terribly right so after 9 11 with the several years thereafter the all the major airlines i think did they all go into bankruptcy uh, Most almost of every them, one of them went into so bank- all the majors at the time yeah went into bankruptcy and these retired pilots they were forced to retire at 60 back then you couldn't fly after the age of 60 and so they're they're Many of them had pensions much larger than sixty-seven thousand dollars a year, but they were all hammered down to the limits were much less than. Yeah, 40, they were like forty some yeah. odd thousand. So we saw pilots that were receiving pension checks, of eighty thousand, a hundred thousand, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, drop by two thirds or more. So, and that's that's the kind of horror story that scares me. And yeah. the PBGC benefit would there be a big shortfall between what i would be receiving under this plan and what that would pay do you have a another do you have any other do you have a lump sum option i do um and it's nice because you can tailor the amount um under one scenario i would take a 50 percent lump sum um and that would be sort of a hedge. The problem is, or what I'm struggling with, and by, is, by the whatever portion you take lump sum is going to reduce any ga- pension bar- guarantees from the PBGC by, by the, the same, same percentage. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Hey, so that's, that's not a mitigating. That's not a mitigating factor. Um, that's not going to be. So, um, so, so here's the. So what happens is, and you know, it's public record uh, what your pension of whether it's properly funded today or not. But the problem yeah. with that is, how old are you, Kevin? I'm approaching 60, very fast. Okay, so, the, and, and you're married, correct? Yes. So you'd probably take a joint survivor. So now Absolutely. we're speculating on the value of a pension 27 years in the future, 30 years in the future, right? Because if yeah, you're I- 60... One of you has a life expectancy of 25 plus years. Are you talking about inflation risk when you say the value no. or the health of the, the, health, the, health of the pension the plan? plan the health of the that's, pension plan. That's, that's, the, that's it in a nutshell. That's it. But I mean, another uh, way to think about this. So I'm just going to throw some up. Let's pretend like the lump sum was a million dollars and the pension, right. the pension's 40 grand a year. It'd be 60 grand a year. Okay. Let's just assume that's your situation. You could sure. say, you know, give me the million bucks. I'm going to go to some private insurance companies and buy my own pension through an immediate annuity. Right. Or another way to look at it, let's say you had a million dollars sitting in your retirement account. Would you say, you know, I feel so good about this company. I'm going to give them my million dollars and let them pay. Give me a lifetime annuity. Right. So. If you have any concern about this, I would. <laughs> strongly look at the lump sum. And if you still say, well, I would need some guaranteed income, I would look at maybe taking a portion of that and buying an, an immediate annuity from, or at least evaluate those options. And you don't have to buy it from one company. You can buy it from multiple companies in order to mitigate, uh, risk. mitigate risk. So the question so, whether, I'm sorry. So your, your thought process there is um, you can get, much more assurance about the stability of a provider by taking it out of this private plan and putting it in an insurance company, which is publicly rated, much more regulation, much more disclosure. You can get more sort of like a sleep at night. Not quite what I said. <laughs> we're, we're, you're, you're stretching it a little bit. But because within okay. the pension, there's a lot of disclosure. 
uh, there are annual yeah. filings. You can see what percentage they're funded. But you can't do anything about and it. And even with insurance companies, they right. could have the best rated, can still in the default. But this, most states have, in the state of California, where you're in, has a, an insurance backdrop similar to an FDIC-type program. So the, the first question is, should you take the pension or the lump sum? And that is dependent upon the uh, the formula they use to determine the lump sum. So today, Number one. Yeah. If today, if you were to take the monthly pension, what is the joint and survivor pension going to be well, on a monthly basis? Well, without quoting numbers, I will just tell you that um, here's the discount rate they use, if that's helpful. Um, they use a kind of a blended rate, a three um, – three-tiered approach, okay. um, interest rate structure of 3.19, 4.25, and 4.60, and that is, those uh, three buckets are based on um, time periods. I think the first one is like one to three years, something yeah. like that. It's Got pretty it. well disclosed and, in here. And are they equally weighted? I don't know if they are. Are so so out, we, we know we know the hurt, know. so the so the the discount rate the hurdle rate's roughly four point two percent yeah that's four point one percent that's the hurdle rate right which is if you think well, if you, you could go out, well if, if you, you think you're going to make more money yeah you could possibly but well it, you might with less risk than what you're I don't I mean without knowing your plan yeah and and if you look at a joint survivor it's actually it's, it's lower less than, than that. that. It's normally about 85 to 90 percent of that, whatever that interest rate is. But other things come into play as well, right? Which is, are you dependent upon this income for your? I mean, is if, if I took the pension, is it 80 percent of my income, 50 percent of my income, 20 percent of my income? What other assets ha do I have? Who do I owe money to? Yeah, all they that. all come into play in this decision. So the idea that, and I've had it before. I'll give you an example. I had clients years ago I, that were neighbors, and I told one person to take the lump sum from one company, and his neighbor came in and said, I want to take the lump sum, and I said, no, take the pension. I'll go even deeper. I had uh, years ago two clients, both AT&T employees. One worked for a legacy spinoff of Ma Bell, whatever it was back then. The other one worked for a different division. One person, their lump sum was based on a true net present value of a pension, the other was based upon what they call cash balance account. And so the person that... And the, the one was arguing with me why, because he wanted to take the lump sum, and I was begging him to take the pension because the the lump sum just wasn't that big in relation. And he had also had the same concerns, but yeah. his pension wasn't that large, and I was we were confident yeah. about the insurance. So you need to figure yeah. out the hurdle rate, and there's and the only way you're going to get guaranteed income and mitigate risk is if you take the lump sum... And you buy four different immediate annuities from four different companies. I would actually, I would see what you would, be, you know, part of this, your due diligence process is is see what you can get from a commercial insurance company right now on yeah. a lifetime pension. It's called an immediate annuity. You could, there's some calculators online. Yeah, you, could just, you could just Google no load immediate annuity. Yeah. And I'm going to throw yeah. one, we're going to throw one more hurdle in here, Kevin. And these interest rates, this blended rate they're using, they change. And oh, I, yeah. Yeah. And it, some companies will do this on a quarterly basis, some on a semi-annual basis. Sometimes you know 15 days in advance. Sometimes you don't. And in addition to this interest rate, we need to understand what life expectancy table they're using. But what can happen is as those rates change, your lump sum could e either go up or go down. So, uh, so let's just say hypothetically you're planning on retiring in two years. Is that what you said? Something like that. Okay, yeah. let's just yeah. say, let's say you plan on retiring two years from now. Let's say it's August of uh, 2021. And let's say that your plan changes uh, the interest rate every six months. And come July of 2021, interest rates are going higher and they bump up. This could, it could have a, a reduction of your lump sum 3%, 5%, 15%, 10%, 20%. 10 or it can go the other way. So, so we've advised people. Look, don't retire today. You're going to wait six six weeks or seven weeks and two days because of the change in the interest rate. So that's another factor that comes into play. So Yeah, yeah. So if you're are not there, thoroughly there... confused with this conversation, then. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah, well, I, there's just a lot of things to consider. That's are, right. are there private consultants out there who will um, review plans like this for individuals? I don't, I don't know. know any. I don't know any. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the problem is, I my sense is the plan is pretty sound today. Yes. It's more about what these employers decide to do in the future. Um, yeah, well, I mean, but even before you take the lump sum, I would look at what what what's available in the in the marketplace. I mean, you, you're familiar with this because you work there and you know it. That's why you're familiar with it. Yeah. In other words, it, it would be worth taking a look to see if you I would. take that lump sum. I, look, Kevin, I remember, day, I remember day, this was years ago, just the way interest rates were changing this plan. We had clients take a lump sum pension on, on and turn around and invest them in U.S. Treasuries. That's right. I, remember, I was that And had that. a higher... Uh, income than they would on a joint and survivor pension. And now their principal is guaranteed by the federal government, U.S. Treasury. They, yeah. they remain their principal intact. And we bought long treasuries because it was the same as buying an, is a lifetime annuity. Then in the early 2000s, we hate annuities by the, but there was a there was a time when these variable annuities where people could take a lump sum, transfer the risk to an insurance company, maintain their principal, maintain. The whatever allocation they wanted, they had full control over management, and the insurance company guaranteed a pension, a month, essentially a monthly income that was more than the the pension. So correct, but and, those and, days those days are long gone. Yeah, yeah. but we're yeah. still two years. I mean, a lot can happen in two, two years. years. Who knows? Yeah. So, but you're doing. Oh, yeah. You're asking the right question. When you when you're when you're three months or two months away from a retirement, call us right. up. Um, and give us the exact numbers, what the monthly is and what the lump sum is, and we could yeah. give you more direction. Or one of our all with, all with oh, yeah, advisors would be advisors happy to do the same. Nope, so appreciate the call. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. All right, thank you, guys. We wish Bye. you well. You know, it's interesting, Pat, before we go back to this next call, um, and uh, this might not be very politically correct in the path I'm going to head down here. Wow, but- <laughs> stop, Ben. Don't even, don't even. So private companies. Okay. Like Kevin worked for here. I know where you're going to go. Private companies, if they don't have the funds to make good on their pension plans and they go into bankruptcy, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation comes to the rescue for the pensioners and replaces the pension. But up to a limit, right? So the limit right now is $67,000 for a 65-year-old. So what ends up happening in private companies, retirees that have larger pensions, those pensions get crammed down. A reduction, yes, to the essentially the upper limit, yes. Private companies, private, public entities, states, municipalities. What happens cities. there? Let's use some example. Stockton, Chicago, Vallejo. Those both Stockton, went into bankruptcy. California, Vallejo, California, Chicago. What happened to those public pensions? Nothing. Nothing. Why? You know, periodically you see the the printout of all the people with six figure retirement pension. And by the way, if that's you, good for you. You you were promised it. You know what? Normally the highest ones are like this psychiatric doctors at state hospitals, like some of the highest earners in the state of California. I just find that curious. But that's got to be a really hard do- job. I mean, <laughs> oh God! Really? You want to talk about dealing with the mom? <laughs> Yeah. How was your day today, honey? Oh, it was awesome. I had the most enjoyable conversation. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Anyway. So, I, but the public pensions, there, there, there is there's been no, no discussion of there's that. There's no mechanism. And there's been no discussion of that sort it of thing. It doesn't appear. Just like there. there's a limit on FDIC insurance. There is. There's limits in almost every other area except but they did, public pensions. But they did raise, during the Great Recession, they did raise the limits on the FDIC insurance. They, they raised did. them to 250 an individual. Or $2 million as long as there's two owners of the trust and at least four beneficiaries. $2 million with, that's the maximum? If you have, uh, if it's owned by trust with two owners of the trust and four beneficiaries. Husband and wife with four kids. Eight times two fifty, two million. I'm just showing off wow, now. Bad. Look at you with the math skills. <laughs> Look at that. All right, let's continue on. If you want to join the, our show here, 833-99-WORTH is the contact number. 833-99-WORTH. And numerically, it's 833-999-6784. That will get you on with Scott Hansen and Pat McLean of Allworth Financials Money Matters. And we're talking with Bob in Colorado. Bob, you're with Allworth's Money Matters. Uh, hello, gentlemen. How are you today? Good. How are you, Bob? I am fine. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to give you a comp- like to give you a compliment because moved here from Wisconsin three years ago, had a real difficult time finding a decent financial show that actually gives information. And you guys do a great job, so thank you very much. Well, thank oh, thank you. you. Yeah, we're um, broadcast on KOA out of Denver. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, my question is regarding a qualified distribution. I'm 70 and a half this year, um, and I would like to make a dona- donation to a nonprofit charitable organization. Mm-hmm. Okay. My, my financial advisor, and I have a checking account set up directly with my IRAs, and so I can write checks directly from them. My financial advisor says, write the check, no problem, take it off the end of the year. My what? tax person says, my tax person says, it has to be a di- direct transfer. That's correct. That's correct. From, okay, so. Your financial advisor is checking, wrong. You're, even if you have a checking okay. account. It, does, it doesn't matter. It has to go directly to the charity. Because a checking account, right. technically, you are withdrawing that funds is going to a, a – you're doing a withdrawal. And so what happens is that if you put it into your checking account, you may or may not get a deduction for it, depending upon what okay. other deductions. But you're most likely, if you're like most Americans, you you take a standard deduction – so it that that donation probably does you no good unless it comes directly from the IRA to the charitable entity. Cannot be a charitable trust. It has to be the charity. Yeah, it can't itself. be a donor advised fund. It has to go directly to okay. the charity. So your financial advisor so if, is wrong. Okay, so even if the check my check checking account is set up directly with our retirement account. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Has All to right. go. So let me. So let me then, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think the mechanics of this. The, the checking account, because my guess this is the checking account. You're actually doing a withdrawal from your IRA when funds go right. get transferred to your che- to your ability to write a check on it. Yes. That's that's. But the, what I, there, there's X number of dollars in the cash yeah. side of my IRA. Huh. And the well, checkbook, the checkbook is set up to why, that cash why, side. But why would you, why would you even risk it? Yeah, you can just go. Yeah, just, just go to your financial advisor, give them the name of the charity, and the tax ID number and the amount, and then you sign a little piece of paper, and it's direct, done. Direct transfer. It's done. And that what, and what you just told me is the information that, for whatever reason, I I could not get the and tax I ID number. It. Well, nobody ever told me that. Get oh, got the tax it. ID number and boom, do it. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, pretty correct, simple. Correct, correct, so, correct, correct. If you call the charity, in fact, if you go to the charity's website, it mm-hmm. most likely is actually listed. If it's a larger charity, if it uh, their tax ID number. Well, it's a church. So okay, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, perfect. The church will have the tax okay. ID number. It's a great way to do it because well, when you when it's a trustee to trustee transfer like that, you can you can gift up to 100% of your required minimum distribution and it does not flow through your tax form okay so here's why this could be beneficial because money that comes through our our tax form we have our deductions and actually our itemized deductions can list all our our charitable expenses there so for some for some Americans uh, for some it, it's not necessary but today when we've got a high uh, standard um, deduction Someone wants to give a couple thousand bucks or ten thousand dollars to their church on an annual basis, they most likely will not get a tax deduction. If, on the other hand, your required minimum minimum distribution is let's say ten thousand dollars, you can have that go directly, and it's just like getting the deduction because you are never you are escaping the taxation on so it. So you I, don't get you don't get the deduction, but you also don't have to claim the tax the ten thousand dollar taxable withdrawal. It's like it never happened, and yes. and we do it with right. clients on an annual basis as part of our financial planning and tax planning for them. It's like who are you giving money to, how much, and let's just do it out of your um, account to satisfy the required minimum distribution. Okay. All righty. Well, I thank you. I thank you very much. And as usual, you've uh, given someone who's called you information okay. that they need. And, and, you, you'll, and that's you'll want to do it by that's December. That's what I like about your program. Thank oh, you. thank you. Oh. You'll want to do it by December thirty first of this year. You actually have it. You're seventy and a half. You have until April. When do you turn age seventy and a half? About three, two weeks ago. Okay. 
so you you're yeah. re- you're required to by April first of next year. But but you want to do it. Otherwise, this year. you've got two distributions to worry about. And yeah. I wouldn't. You want to do it this year. Yeah. Right. And I wouldn't wait. No, no. I'd... Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to wait. No, until... I'm gonna. I'm... Just, I've been just trying to get this answer, and so um, you know, Bob. Bob my, and so my wife and I use a charitable trust, and I always feel bad that when they're passing the, the Catholic Church, when they're passing the hat around, <laughs> well, you feel bad just the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, when they're passing, <laughs> when they're passing the things around, then I'm not putting money in, so I've been slipping in empty envelopes. Oh, you have not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, Bob. Yeah. I must say, I because I and this happens. <laughs> <laughs> and this happens to be a Catholic church too. So I, I, you know, just slip the. the I'm going to start doing that. <laughs> just Although gonna, when, when I was when I was young and dating my uh, my wife was my fiance at the, the time, my father lock gave me some cash to put. In. <laughs> I'm like I'm 25 years old. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Let's Did take a grill. Really? Yeah, yeah, here's a couple of dollars. Like, 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 like I'm four. <laughs> <laughs> well, stick do around you, for more All Worst Money now? Matters. No, you I should, should do that to yeah. him now. We'll be right back. Can't get enough of Allworth's Money Matters? Visit allworthfinancial.com slash radio to listen to the Money Matters podcast. Do you have a financial question that needs answering? Call us at 833-99-WORTH. That's 833-99-WORTH. Welcome back to Allworth's Money Matters. I'm Scott Hansen. I'm Pat McClain. Glad you're sticking around for our Fun with Finance program. All worth money matters. There we go. Yes. And to be part of our program today, if you'd like to join us, have a call. We had a couple of good calls since last time. Uh, we think so. This yeah. could very well shape out to be one of our best shows ever. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Unless we mess it up the second this half This is here. really, we are on a great run to, uh, <laughs> so, to one of our all-time best. <laughs> And you can help make that possible. Oh, yes. Yes. Anyway, to join us, 1-833-99-WORTH is the contact number. Again, uh, toll free, it's 833-99-WORTH. And you're looking at me like you're trying to interrupt oh. me, but I'm not going to lie. No, keep going. Eight, <laughs> numerically, it's 833-999-6784. And um, the other night... I uh, went online and read some uh, reviews of our podcast. So over the last month or two, we've been asking people to um, review us because it helps our rankings and more people listen. And at some point in time, we're going to become um, minor celebrities. But (laughs) (laughs) at some point in time. Well, I've I've got like six Instagram followers now. So there's just a few more. So um, we're not allowed to ask you to leave positive reviews. But we are allowed because of the regulatory environment in which we work. But we are allowed to ask people to leave reviews, right? Yes. So, but we probably can, if you don't like us, please do not review us. How's that? That's fair enough because that's <laughs> the regulatory yeah. environment says that we are not allowed to ask for testimonials. No, we can't publish. We testimonials. can't publish testimonials. Yes. People can give us reviews. Though. Yes. So you can review us. And by the way, the way to do that. Is I only know how to do iPhone i the podcast thing on iPhones. What do okay. they call it? A podcast. Yeah. iTunes. iTunes is that what it is? Anyway, yeah. go to the podcast thing, and, or iHeart and has search it too. search all worth's money matters. That's all where worth you find it. Money all matters. worth's money matters. It'll come right up, and you can click uh, give us stars, and you can yeah. uh, say how funny Pat is and how Scott keeps him on course. And I was actually listening to podcasts, not my own, because that'd just be creepy. Um, last night when I was picking the garden. You go Wait a minute. Garden? You, so Pat, uh, Pat actually has a pretty good sized garden. And you told me in the past that you allow, you had the gardener pick the garden. Yeah. The gardener. Yeah, someone come and mow and blow. Not and then I would the let garden. him, correct. I would let the gardener pick the garden up. Garden, but the gardener is now my son, so he's not going to pick the garden. So I'm oh, stuck what picking, picking the garden. How long has your son been the garden gardener? Uh, I don't know. He's opened a commercial landscaping company a couple months ago, and so he does my yard. Did he give you a family discount? Are you out of your mind? He does not. 
No discount at all? No. Well, he should give you some sort of nah. discount after all that. Uh, Every, nope. Yeah. Nope. No discount whatsoever. His mom writes the checks. Does he get a little extra bonus? Then? Oh, I have no idea how much she pays him, but I'm sure it's above market. <laughs> my wife was. Te- it's funny about having uh, young adults. Uh, my son was uh, abroad for school last fall. Okay, I hope I didn't tell the story once, but um, he was in Geneva, Switzerland. A great program. It was actually a really great program because he he had he had the first half of the semester they had class, the second half. He had a job. It worked. It was an internship, it four days a week. Chocolate factory. It was some uh, NGO, a nonprofit. Oh, and he was. <laughs> it wasn't a very well-run NGO either. No, no. He says so all, a non-government organization. He says all they whatever grant they got, that's what they worked on. Oh, until he became the money. very very disenfranchised with NGOs as a result. I said, well, yeah. they're not all that way, but I'm glad you're disenfranchised with some because not just because disenchanted, some, disenchanted, disenfranchised. That's a different meaning. <laughs> yes. Uh, so. Apparently, my wife was teasing me the other day. That I was complaining that my, my son's cost me too much money because he's okay. a college student, right? I was complaining like he always <laughs> needs money. And right about then, the phone rings, and he's calling from Europe. My son, my son's on the phone. Hey. From it's, Europe. And it's he? It's Blake. Well, excited. He's, <laughs> he says he's on a train going to Paris for the weekend. And the first thing I said was, do you need some money? <laughs> <laughs> you said it. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why... Yeah. Uh, you know what you're going to do. Yeah. He's a nice like, kid. Yeah. Making good choices. Working yeah. Hard my, my, my son, my last out of four, goes to college next month. Wow. I, he told me the other day, only 25 more days. I didn't say it. He said it to me. We only have to do this for 25 more days. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> when you try to discipline me, and I try to sneak around behind your back. <laughs> We only have to do this for 25 more days, Dad. I mean, I'm sure I remember when I was that age. I'm just thinking back. Was I excited when I heard my dad's car pull the driveway? Yay, Dad's home. Oh, it's Mom. That stops when they're about four. (laughs) All right, we got to get back to the the show. So if you want to join the show, it's 833-99-WORTH. Yeah, and let's talk to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you're with Scott Hansen and Pat McLean. All Worth Money Matters. Hi, thank you so much, and I appreciate you taking my call. Thank you. How can we help? Um, well, I believe it's similar to Scott. My uh, youngest will be leaving for college uh, in a few days, uh-huh. and wow. I have an opportunity to, um, and I'm contemplating taking an early retirement at 55 next year. And my question for you are what are your thoughts on me deferring collecting my pension or lump sum out by anywhere from five to seven years, what will put me at, you know, 62 to 65. That might be a great idea. Yeah. So, um, why, why do you, why do you want to, uh, why do you want to retire early first? Yeah. Well, um, it's our youngest son and my husband would just like to be closer to him. He'll be going out of state for college and just also for cost of living, future retirement. Oh, so you're thinking about uh, mo- retiring and leaving the state of California? I eventually, yes, yes, or going back and forth. My 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 uh, my side of the family is still here, but there might not be a, there's an opportunity to relocate and um, close to your close close to where your son is going to college and would you oh yeah and also and also be able to just make sure that you know he's not that we've ever had any problems but just to be sure that he does our last one and we want him to uh, to be successful. Have you had this conversation <laughs> with him? I was thinking. <laughs> Does he know? Guess what, yes, son? Yes. Mom's yes, down yes. in no, dorm 4B. Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Maybe I, you I, could go no, over and clean his dorm really room, do his wash. He would like that. Yeah, he would like that. I, I just don't. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah. the answer to the question is, should you defer your pension? I guess the bigger question I would have is, how... Let's assume you retire at 55, and let's assume you defer your pension for, let's say, seven years. How are you going to have income during those, those seven years? 
Well, um, I have a right now a four thousand dollar positive cash flow on one of my income properties. Okay. And so my other question to you would have been, should I take some of the cash that I have and pay off? Uh, so if you are in a financial if, if, if you're in a financial situation where you can afford to retire at 55, great, because that was I think our fir- my first concern away was like, don't tell me you're going to start spending down some other savings to, in order to defer this. And then where's the pension coming from? Are you, do, are you a government employee or is this a company? Um, a, a large HMO, and I'll be able to, and, I'll, and I'm going to get gap medical. Got it. So I would have, I would have health wow, insurance great. for not only myself, but my husband and my son until he's 26. Okay. So the answer to the question is, should you take any part of your pension lump sum or IRA and pay down the mortgage is probably not. The reason is uh, the tax implications associated with doing so. If you have money outside of an IRA or 401k, such as in a bank account or brokerage account, you may want to actually pay down that mortgage um, depending upon the tax implications If it's in a brokerage account and you own stocks or mutual funds uh, or stock mutual funds, you may have some capital gains in there. So the answer to that question is if it's sitting in cash, pay down the mortgage. Um, And it doesn't necessarily have to be – Pay down the mortgage. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that mortgage. Um, It may make sense for you to pay down your primary uh, mortgage first. Whatever has the highest interest rate is what you want to pay down first. Um, okay. Yeah. That was my question. Should it be the primary home first or the rental? But I'm thinking primary. It, whatever the highest interest rate is. Oh, highest so, well, can't say combo. <clears throat> highest interest rate and what's going to make you feel the best. Okay. Why do you say that, right. Scott? Because people tend, tend to have a feeling that when their home is paid off, you know this, Pat, we've been doing it long enough. When their home is paid off, they tend, tend to have more uh, comfort in their retirement. And when th- if the economy goes through shocks, like maybe her rental income's not as great or the stock market's down, if the home primary residence home paid off, people tend to have a Got better it. feeling. I'll buy that. Years. I'll buy that. So let's just let's address that issue first. Tell us about your primary residence. What's it worth? Well, actually, we just bought another home cash in another state. Okay. Uh, but the, my primary home that I'm in now, which I was going to rent out, is about 600 And what do you owe on it? Uh, less than 200. 200. And are you going to rent it out because you might come back to it? Um, I have a couple of more rentals, so I just am used to having some rentals. But and yeah, and a possibility that. Okay. So you know, it, here's the here's the if you are definitely not going to rent it out, we would strongly encourage you to sell that and buy a different rental because this has been your primary residence, and you could exclude from taxation you and your husband five hundred thousand dollars worth of gain. So I don't know what you paid for this, but the way to avoid the any ever paying capital gains on it is to sell it as your primary residence. If you keep it and turn it into rental after a few years it's going to be a rental property and that capital gain that's been incurred over the years when you ever sell the thing is going to have to be paid at the time. So the the idea being is that if you had the identical home next door, you would sell your home and buy the one next door just because of the tax implications. That's number one. So that's your primary. And who else do you owe money on? You owe a couple of rentals. So we're going to answer these questions first, and then we're going to get to your deferring the pension. So how much do you owe on rental number one? Um, 200. And what's the value of the home? Well, here's the thing. I have a total of about 2.2 million of real estate and my total debt for the real estate is about 475. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. I would defer the pension. I would defer okay. the pension. I So I would defer the pension and then I would actually, uh, Look at, uh, I'd sell the primary residence if I was moving. I wouldn't convert it to a Do you have an option of a lump sum on the pension? I do. But uh, I was listening to your show, actually. It was my first time about a month ago when you recommended, um, because of the corporation, to go for the 
monthly versus the lump sum. Yeah, every situation, every is situation's different. different. Yeah. Situation is different, right? Yeah. So right, you mean right. the, no, yeah, the, the, the younger you are, the more attractive the lump sum option is. Then the older you become, the more attractive the monthly income is. And the interest rate that they oh. use internally. So if you actually tell us the monthly amount and the lump sum, we'll tell okay. you whether you should take the monthly or. Oh, so. well, it'll be different next year, but yeah. But so, what's the the monthly amount? Okay. Uh, well, at fifty five, it'll be two thousand, and the lump sum is three ninety. Well, that is Six. That's game. not. Uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> I take, 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 take the pension. pension. I, I know, take the pension. I, I take the pension, and I would defer it. Well, yeah, that's yeah. not a. That's yeah. not. That's not right. a very good lump right. sum to that. Yeah. To that's that not monthly. a very good. So, now, but I, the very next caller, just for the rest of the list, for all the listeners, the very next call, we would possibly rule one hundred percent the opposite, because every pension is different. Every pension. Mm-hmm. It fits the individual. Okay. So in your particular situation, I would actually look at consolidating debt on to the lowest cost debt possible. And right now would be a good time. Interest rates are extremely low. And I would defer the pension as long as I possibly could. Okay. That, that's sort of what I was... Yeah. You, by doing so, you just have more guaranteed... Uh, Monthly income down the road. At some point in time. And the reality is you don't know how you're going to act in retirement. You very well may go back to work. It is not unusual at all for someone to retire in their mid-50s and go back to work for two reasons. One, they get bored. Two, there's no one to play with. Their, all their friends. She, Elizabeth work. is going to sign up for the classes with her son. She's, She's going to go 55. right to the college. Yes, right um, there. Well, well, you know, that was an option. There we go. He'd love to see you on campus. <laughs> But, um, no, no, it'd be a, a different, different place. I get it. He's teasing you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. All right, have a great day. Uh, parents too. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. Called. It is a, it, you know, it's funny because there's quite a few pe- people I think sending their kids off to college uh, this time of year. I watched that movie where Melissa, who Melissa McCarthy went back to college with her daughter. Is she the foul mouth? Uh... No, she's not too foul mouth. Oh, but she's... Who am I thinking of? Oh, I Amy Schumer. Oh, yeah. But uh, Melissa McCarthy, the whole premise of the thing is that this lady gets a divorce, doesn't know what to do, and then goes to college with her daughter. And is the and life they were like of, good buddies? The life of the campus. It's, uh, it's like a Rodney Dangerfield. What was the name of that? Uh, she back was... to school, Rodney Dangerfield. I don't think started that. Oh, it was epic. It was one of the Oh, yeah, I'm sure it was. Rodney yeah, Dangerfield yeah, in the yeah, movie Back to School. All the great movies starred <laughs> Rodney. Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> all right. <laughs> if you want to be part of All Worth's uh, Money Matters, to our contact number here, 833-99-WORTH. Toll free, 833-99-WORTH. We're in Washington, D.C., talking with Richard. Richard, you're with All Worth's Money Matters. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I've listened to you guys since I was a teenager, so I really appreciate your show. Well, and how old you. are you today? I'm uh, 33. Wow. All that thank is you. not good. <laughs> 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 what have I done with my life? <laughs> okay, so uh, you obviously lived in the Northern California area at some point in time. I did, yeah. I grew up around there, and uh, I'm a Chico State grad. Oh, All right. there you go. Well, you know, I don't know if you knew this, but Scott Hansen was uh, your distinguished alumni of yeah, we, we, Chico State. Pick right? someone. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, so, what can we do for you, Richard? So, I I am uh, struggling with how I approach real estate in my 30s if I'm not ready to buy a home that I'm actually going to live. So, I I'm in the military and I move around every couple of years, so I've avoided buying any real estate. But now that I'm in my 30s, I'm wondering if I should buy a rental property or if I should continue to save outside of my retirement accounts for when I'll what do you actually... have? What do you have saved now? Um, in terms of money that would be used for a down payment, no, about just... 50000 50, Okay. And and then what do you have in your um, retirement plan? Uh, total retirement plans is about 350000 Oh, my. wow. How old are you? <laughs> He's 33. <laughs> you're 33. Holy smokes, you're doing a great job. That is that is Thank the you. largest account balance I have ever seen. For at a 33-year-old. It's someone his age. You obviously have put the maximum in. From day one. From day one and kept it 100% equity, I am assume. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and I started a Roth back when I was. 17 or 18 my dad helped me with that yeah so slow you, you know it's helpful. it's you know what i appreciate about this call richard it 
it wealth accumulation uh, it takes it for all, almost all of us it takes sacrifice and discipline that's what it right? takes you've been in the military it's not like you've have some fat huge mungus pay that you've been earning but you've been disciplined since day 1 to set aside some of your first dollars into your retirement account and now you're 33 you've got four, 350 grand in your retirement and 50,000 you have 400 grand saved good for you Good for you. And you're in the military. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. You should be Fantastic. proud of that. Are you married? I am not. Okay. No That's children. why he has 400000 well, Okay. So, I'm just so th- that goes to the, the reason I asked that question is, is it goes to where you would buy a house or a rental house. Um, I mean, you're in D.C. Of course. You can't buy anything there. <laughs> no. No. Where would you return to if you, um, if you were to buy a house? If I got out of the military today and moved anywhere, I'd probably go back to uh, Northern California or to Reno. Then that's probably the area. If, so if you were to buy, I'm trying to think here. So let me, if you were my younger brother or my son, because you could be for that matter, um, I'm trying to think, would I even encourage you to buy? It's just not, the, the problem I have. It's just more work. And I'm there's no. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, there is. Um, I would look. I'd look at if I could buy something with a decent return. If or you could put 50, break even. 50 grand down, or you need a little less than that, so you have some buffer in case the thing needs yeah. some repairs or whatever. The people quit paying their rent, and you got to evict them and all that stuff. Uh, and see if you got a, a mortgage today, what it would pencil out to be. Yeah. So you want to. You buy, don't want to be negative. That's for that's sure. That's what you. So I. I like the idea. You don't want to buy anything more than maybe ten or fifteen years old. You want, um, you know, stucco house, um, no swimming pool. Um, well, maybe stucco, depending on where he lives. Reno, I suppose. Well, stucco. Reno, or he said Reno or Northern California. So uh, no swimming pool, and you want to look to see if you could do it at a break even or better. I would do it. I would recommend. It. I actually okay. like the idea. So what you're looking for is a placeholder. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I like the idea. I like the And idea. although real estate okay. prices are high, the, Reno's we, nothing like. But we, we you definitely don't want to go to the hot markets. Yeah, co- correct. Reno's picked up more so in the commercial than it is in the residential uh, in terms of, but there's lots of buildings still going on in Reno. And there's lots of land. It, it is almost <laughs> surrounded by land. <laughs> pl- Nevada's got plenty of places to build. If yeah. You haven't been to Nevada. Like. I actually was not in Reno not too long ago. So. It's like being in a convection oven. It's flowing at like 50 miles an hour. It's 110 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> but it's nice. I like I like Reno. I like Okay. Reno. All righty. Yeah, that's what I – yeah, I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you very That's much. why I would look. I wouldn't look anywhere else. Yeah, and thanks for uh, being a longtime listener. Yeah, and that congrats on yeah, your um, – Yeah, $350,000 yeah. in his – That's just good display. IRA and 401K. Appreciate and the call. And thank you for your service too, Richard. Yeah, yeah it's 33 not- years old. That is impressive. I mean, that is just really... And he's really, in the military pay. Yeah, that is really, really impressive. I mean, sometimes we come across people that, but they've... They, maybe they worked for the right company, or they were just great at their career, or a but great salesperson or something, to make it a huge... He made his first uh, he made his first Roth contribution when he was seventeen. With the help of his father. He did. I bought my first stock when I was 17. I helped my kids out with um, their Roth as soon as they had any reportable wages. And then? Yeah. Yeah. Did I do? I didn't do that with my kids. I didn't do a Roth. I don't know why. But my son is day trading now, so I'm proud of that. <laughs> my, my, he's a junior down at uh, UCLA. He day, he, he, in fact, is, uh, is he proud of it? Is, uh, my, my nephew, uh, who works here as a summer intern, was actually the How one. long has he been day trading? Uh, not too long. My oldest day traded for probably a year and then finally gave up and my youngest here's what day traders here's what they one. need if you're day trading you you need to compare your performance to the what the what's the market been doing that same correct. time you're invested right correct 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 so for example if 2018 was slightly down for the yeah. equity markets right so if you were a day trader and you were down let's say one percent and the s p 500 was down what was it down four percent five percent something like that last year well you did pretty good Not you bad. made three you made more than the market yeah but if you're in a period of time when, let's say, the market's up, up 10 and you're up 10, what'd you do it for? I remember in 1999, the NASDAQ was up 85%. 
85%. That's if you can remember that. Now, how, oh, let's, let's go to that. Oh. No, no, and, no. Let me finish the story. Okay. I got something I want to share, too. As day trader was bragging about his tech stocks and how well he did in his tech stocks, because his tech stocks, he said he earned 78% last year. And I said, 78%, you would have been better off Just buying, the buying the index and quit wasting all your time day trading. Yeah. Because the thing about day trading, uh, I, I, I want to talk about that too, but let's, we're going to talk about that in the next show because okay. we'll, we only have a couple minutes here. And I'm going to finish my topic. Here. Okay. The, the, the challenge with any time you're trading like this, if you're trying to make money, and I hear these ads. Oh, yes. Yes. Like and I listen don't need to these infomercials. You, you can just day trade and trade and trade. We'll teach you One how to One guy's like a pastor. It's like day trade God's way or something. I don't know. I didn't quite call it that, but that's what his implication is. When you trade and, and your plan is to make money off trading, you are going to make money two ways. One is the, the broad market is going up, which you could have done sitting on anyway. the sidelines. Or you will make money when someone else loses. Yeah, over if you're if you're day trading if, over. Short Anytime of time. you're trying to make money as a trader, you will make money, unless you're the middleman. Then they're the like broker. the casino house. Then you make, but then you encourage that sort of thing, which is why they encourage that sort of thing because they make money on the trades. But you're going to make money when someone else loses. And I always say, remember who you're competing against on every transaction. When you're buying, there's someone else making a sell decision. And look at what Deutsche. And when you're selling. There's someone else making that buy decision. Look, and Deutsche Bank, one of the largest banks in the world, just closed a whole division of traders that were what they call prop traders, proprietary traders that would trade on behalf of the bank. Why? Because they weren't making any <laughs> they more money. They weren't making any money. <laughs> and when you're day trading, you're competing. Goldman Sachs has a whole floor of traders. And, and these top <laughs> business schools are cranking out pe- uh, newly minted MBAs that are going to work for these firms. You're competing against those. That's what you're competing against. So when I hear these infomercials, they're going to teach you how to day trade and give you the sell and buy signals. I kind of, I'm thinking. Well, actually, so then when my, when my son or my nephew were talking to me about day trading, I wouldn't even engage them in the conversation. What's the point? It's like, this is. You'll you know, they'll learn. Yeah, yeah. That's the and whole they're point. Young, I'd rather you learn when you're 21. Instead of with your retirement when you can't afford when to you're make those 50. Losses. Yes. All right. We're, to, uh, we're out of time. Unfortunately, we are out of time. It's been uh, wonderful having you with us this uh, weekend or if you're on podcast when you're listening. If you haven't been to our website in a while, check it out, allworthfinancial.com. We've got some great resources on there. We'll see you next week. This has been All Worth Money Matters. This program has been brought to you by Allworth Financial, a registered investment advisory firm. Any ideas presented during this program are not intended to provide specific financial advice. You should consult your own financial advisor, tax consultant, or estate planning attorney to conduct your own due diligence.